We've been talking in this Chain Breaker series that God wants to bring you home. He wants to bring you home to the place where he is. He wants to put you in a family and he wants to give back to you everything the enemy has stolen from your life. And today we have the opportunity, I believe, to talk about one of the greatest chains in all of the lives of the people in this house today that Jesus wants to break, and that is the chain of debt. You know, for a lot of us, um, we're maybe a, a step ahead of addiction or debauchery or drunkenness or adultery or some of the big things we consider uh, the chains on people's lives, but this chain of debt is a sneaky one, right? Right? Because it just kind of works its way into the lifestyle and all of a sudden we find that we are not free to follow the Spirit in our lives and we're not leaving a wake of generosity in our lives because of the chain of debt that is on our lives. And I pray today that God will start a work in every life in this house today that will break the chain of debt over our lives When we say debt, you know, a lot of things go off in our mind. I immediately go to the national debt because that's part of the fabric of the conversation in our country. I looked up the national debt clock, which you don't really want to do uh, late at night. It's a a fast-moving counter on this website. Our national debt, let's talk about that first, $21 trillion. Well, nobody lost any sleep over that last night, probably. But that thing is ticking along at a really fast clip. For every citizen in America, that's 65 grand. For every taxpayer in America, it's 177 grand that you're on the hook for, for our national debt, which no one really seems to care too much about. And the reason we don't is because, A, it's not my problem. B, I didn't make those decisions. C, I can't do anything about it. And D, by the time all that blows up, I probably won't be here anyway. Don't we have this mentality? Somebody else will figure that out. We'll pass that along to our kids and our grandkids, and they'll solve those problems in a later lifetime, but I won't have to worry about that. But when we say 31 trillion, 65,000, 177,000, basically there's a numb reaction, an underreaction to most people because we just shrug our shoulders and go, yeah, that's kind of the way life is. But we broke that down from the national debt to our debt today. It gets a little more specific and a little more personal. For the younger people in the house today, that would probably look something like twenty to $70,000 worth of student loans that you're chipping away at slowly but surely, mostly slowly, but oftentimes surely. It would look like our mortgage that we have with uh, XYZ Bank, which is a normal part of the fabric of life for most people. It would look like the I don't know what kind of family you are, the one visa card that you have or the seven visa cards that you have or the that one won't work, okay, let me get this one, okay, no, that one's not good this month, let me try this one credit card. And those are the, the big buckets that all, all of us are dealing around. Maybe you put um, a second mortgage on the home or refinance to take a little money out to pay for a wedding or some emergency that happened and we've got these few little buckets of debt but somehow the way we look at that is I'm doing what I'm doing because of those things. If I didn't get an education, I wouldn't have this job. And if I didn't have this job, I couldn't pay for this mortgage. And therefore, the debt sort of is a part of how I'm actually doing what I'm doing in life. But there's a principle in Scripture that none of us can get around. And it is this idea that the wisdom writer gave us in the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. And the verse says, the borrower is the servant to the lender. And this is an axiom in the kingdom of God that none of us can solve. We all have to wake up to the reality and the power that it has in our lives. The borrower is the servant to the lender. And so if that's true, then It's also true that we're going to be on one of two paths in our lifetime. We're either going to be on a path to slavery or on a path to freedom. Our financial decisions are going to put us on a slavery path. The borrower is the servant of the lender. 
or our decisions financially are going to put us on a path toward freedom. And obviously, Christ has come to set us free. The, the big idea of the gospel today is that our debt eternally is paid by the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So our whole Christian story is predicated on a debt being canceled. And therefore, everything that comes up out of our story is predicated on debts being canceled so that in the Lord's Prayer, one of the things we pray is, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debt towards us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Now, we understand that's in a context of attitudes and thoughts and actions, sinful behavior one towards another, but the way that God talks about this is our debt. A canceled debt on the cross is what gives me a ledger of freedom and the ability to be called a child of God. And free children of God need to live fearless and live free. And the enemy, he's got a lot of different plans for all of us, but he'd say, look, I, I didn't really want you to get saved, but you got saved. I really didn't want you to see the light, but God had grace on you and you saw the light. I didn't really want you to come from death to life, but hello, in, in the spirit, you are now fully alive. And I can't change that, but what I can do is make your life miserable on earth. Maybe you got out of hell and into heaven because your debt was canceled, but I'm gonna make your life on earth hell as much as I can. And one of the ways I'm going to do that for a lot of you is called the chain of debt. So Jesus is in the house today and he's like, hey, let's talk about debt for a minute. Let's talk about finances for a minute. Fortunately, it's passed above and beyond Sunday. Uh, we're not taking a special giving today. Uh, there's not a really big campaign that we're leaning towards. So everybody can take a deep breath today. This is for your freedom, not for the church's offering. This is for your life of freedom, not so that you can put something in a bucket when it comes by in a gathering. This is God wanting to set you free because we can't be servants of the most high God if we're already the servant of fidelity, savings, and trust. And God wants to set you and me on a path called freedom today. It has two parts, and the two parts are this. Number one, we're going to talk about attacking debt, and we're going to get militant about it a little bit. You say, well, that, why do we need to talk about attacking debt? Because debt is attacking you and me. Debt is not passive. It is not kind. It's very intentional, and it's attacking our lives and our ability to be free. And so we want to attack debt, but the second thing we want to talk about is creating margin. And this is because there is a promise today. There's a problem, that's debt, but there's a promise today that if you and I, man, if God will give us the grace today, and I pray that he will, to believe in this promise, oh my goodness, how our mindset is going to change, and I believe ultimately how our lives are going to change. We must move from a finance lifestyle to a pay-as-you-go lifestyle that takes a little adjustment, but man, there's so much freedom in it. So today we're going to begin talking about the second of those things, creating margin with this big idea that God wants to bless you. Now, we're not talking about a health and prosperity gospel today. Somebody's going to always throw that in the, in the mix we're not saying today if you just pray hard enough, you can walk out of the parking lot and where you left a Honda Accord 2008, there's going to be a Mercedes Benz 2017 in the space today. But come on, let's don't let anybody chip away at the idea that God wants to bless your life. God does not want you to live as the servant and the slave of the lender. God actually wants you to live free, to follow the Spirit, and to leave a wake of generosity in your life. Your father is the king of the universe. 
Your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Your father is the one who created everything out of nothing and has already given us an inheritance in heaven with him. Most of our blessings, the best of our blessings, are not silver and gold, land and properties, dollars and cents. The best of our blessings are the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. But your father wants to bless you and not to curse you. And he wants you to live free, and he wants you to live free from the chain of debt in your life. And I'm just praying that even the idea of that would take root in our hearts today, that even the idea of that would take root in your heart right now. I can get out of this mess called debt, and there is a day coming down the road that I can live free in my life. And this starts with a big change of attitude. It starts with flipping the script. So if we're going to talk about finances, we need to do a few diagrams, obviously. And so here's the normal way that I think a lot of people on planet Earth, especially in America, think about finances. And you may want to draw these diagrams, think about them, chew on them a little bit later. We normally start most equations with me. So whatever else is going to happen in life, that's going to all happen to advance me, to advance my ideas, what I want to do, what I want to accomplish, what I want to achieve, what I want to own, what I want to accumulate, what I want to experience. Everything leads up ultimately to me. And when this works out in finances, it looks something like this. The number one priority for my life is to live. And I want to live where I want to live, how I want to live, with what I want to live with, That's the number one goal for me. So I'm working towards this as a number one goal. Secondly, in my life, I do believe in savings. Most people do. And when I can, and if I can, I definitely want to save. Now, that's not first priority. First priority is I want to live. And if after living well, there's a little bit that I can save, of course I'm going to do that. And then third down in the equation is, of course I want to be a generous person. Who wouldn't want to be a generous person? So after I live, and if there's anything left over to save, if there's any residual after all of that, then certainly I'm going to consider giving some of that because I want to be a generous person. And it looks like it makes sense, and I think a lot of people sort of would adopt an idea like this, and maybe you're not thinking, you know, specifically, wow, I I don't really know if I'd said it that way, but if I broke down my paycheck every month, this is kind of the way it works. I pay the mortgage, I pay a a, a rent if you're a renter, I pay my car payment, I pay off my student loan, I pay my credit card bills down, I eat, I have to uh, fix the water heater, blah, 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 we went to Cancun, da, 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 da. Who needs a water heater, right? Um, We've gotten used to cold showers. It's been amazing, but we upgraded on that cruise, and it was worth it. Um, Down here, something's going into savings. I've sort of offloaded that to the the guys in the HR department at work, and they're taking something out of my check before I even see it, because if they left it up to me, ain't nothing going out of the check. Going to upgrade again on on the cruise. And then down here occasionally I'll go, wow, I've got an extra $100 that I didn't even know I had. I'm going to give 10 bucks at church on Sunday. God wants to flip this. And he wants to flip it, obviously, like this. And uh, the orange is not coming through too good, so we'll go to green and orange. Um, he wants to, number one, be the, the top value in our lives. So that everything in our life ultimately is about God and not about us. That ultimately there's a a new perspective in life that leads us to invert this normalized equation so that the, the first priority of our lives is we want to give. When God gives to us, the very first thing we think is, I want to give back to God. When God blesses us, the very first thought we have is, I want to bless God and I want to bless someone else. The second thing we think about when God blesses us is, I want to save. Because life is long, hopefully, um, there's things coming around the corner I don't know. And if I'm not saving, I'm not going to be in a position to do anything that is of my own free will, because I'm going to end up being the servant of the lender all my life, and I'm just going to do whatever the bills tell me that I need to do. 
And then the third thing in the inverted uh, way of thinking about it is I'm going to live. I've got to live. I've got to eat. I've got to wear something. Um, I've got to have a house over my head. I need to get around town. Living is important. But I want to live on what's left after I prioritize giving and saving. And then I'm going to adjust my lifestyle to fit in what I can afford after I give and I save. Instead of adjusting my savings and my giving based on my lifestyle and whatever's left over after my lifestyle gets met. And the difference between these two models is the difference in our lives between whether you're going to be the tail in life or whether you're going to be the head in life. And God is asking you to consider his blessing on you to make you the head and not the tail. This text in Deuteronomy is so beautiful because what it offers to us is a promise. And what I want you to see with me today is that God wants to bless you. He does not want to curse you, but God wants to bless you. And with this lifestyle, there is no blessing. But with this lifestyle, there is a promise. And we are going to see what this promise is in this text. Deuteronomy 28. A lot of blessing coming. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commandments I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth and all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now this is a national blessing and it actually works out in the context of national finance so America could learn something from this. But you and I personally also can come into this promise. Look what the promise is, beginning verse 3. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They'll come at you from one direction, but they'll flee from you in seven. Don't you love that promise? The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and in the crops of your ground and the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. And then this is the key paragraph in verse 12. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. Can you see that happening in your life? That you will become a lender in life, not a borrower in life. The people will come to you through your life and say, could you help me out? And you'll say, yes, I'd be happy to help you out. Versus all through life, you going through the door the other way saying, can you help me out? You'll be the one having the people come through the door and you'll be able to help them out. Verse 13, the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Now we know in Scripture 
that the two big gods in our story are the God Jehovah and the God called money. So much so that the New Testament says you cannot serve both God and money. You will be servant to one, but not to both. The love of money, the New Testament says, is the root of all evil in our lives. Not money, but the love of money. So we already know at the end of this promise when it says, believing in other gods and serving them, that the most likely other God that we're going to believe in is the God called money, and the most likely other God that we're going to serve is the God called money. And God is saying, I want to flip the script for you, and I, I want you to change from a lifestyle that's going to lead you to be the tail. You're going to be wagged by the economy, wagged by the, I mean, controlled by the interest rate. You're going to be controlled by the circumstance. You're going to be controlled by the accumulation of the bills that come. That's going to dictate the decision making. I want to make you the head. I want to make you a, a, a child of promise. And I want to bless you in everything that you do in your life. But it is an equation that begins with saying, God, I want to follow your ways. I want to follow what you say is the right way for how I live my life. And what I love about this, if you think about these two, uh, these two diagrams, the first one, if you think about it like a funnel, is simply this. Your catch point, if it's me, then saving and then giving, your catch point for the blessing of God is very small. And your back door of where all the wealth that you do have is very big. And all of a sudden, you look around after four years of a really good job and go, I don't have any savings. I haven't really knocked down any of my debt. I really haven't put myself in any better position to follow the Spirit of God. And I'm not really leaving a wake of generosity yet. But man, I had a lot come in. But when we invert the principle and we begin to think like God thinks, our catch point for the blessing of God gets really, really big. And the end result of the blessing God gives us is a very focused life. So things aren't just blowing out the back and we don't have any idea what happened, but things are very directed in our lives and we're able to catch more of the blessing of God, if you will, that he wants to bring to our lives. So let's talk about this other side just for a moment. Let's talk about giving and talk about saving and talk about living, because these, we have to get practical for a moment. Giving is simply a recognition, and I won't try to write that because it will, you won't be able to read it anyway. It's simply a recognition of who God is. That's why we begin with the gift. We start with the gift. If you're in a church context, we, we start with a tithe. It's a tenth. It's a biblical principle from beginning to the end in Scripture. It's us recognizing everything we have comes from God and then returning to God the first fruit of everything he gives us. First decision, first fruit. First decision, first fruit. I know, but I got $40,000 in student loans. I know, but the first thing I'm going to do is give God 10% of what he's given me. First decision, first fruit, first 10%. I'm going to give first. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it's going to come on the screen, and this is what it says. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the whole first fruit, that there may be food in my house. So number one reason we're doing this is so that God's house will have enough to continue to meet the needs of the community and the city and the world. But then God says, test me in this. In other words, if you don't know if this works or not, if you're not sure if this is the way or this is the way, then just do a test. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Try it. And you say, well, I did. I gave 20 bucks a couple Sundays ago and uh, nothing happened. Let's give God a little bigger test than that. We've been in debt for 19 years. It might take longer than 19 minutes to get out of debt. And so let's do a test. Let's decide right now on a percentage scale, not guessing, absolute down to the dollar, every single thing God gives you, whether it's a gift that came from your aunt in New Jersey, or whether it's your paycheck that came, or whether it is a tax 
refund that you got, everything that comes back from God, we're gonna take 10% off the top and invest it into the eternal things of God. We're gonna do that for one year. And at the end of that year, we're gonna see where we are based on what happened the last 10 years in our lives. And if it doesn't work, then you can stand up. You could stand up right now and say, we did that. We tithed. We committed to God first. We gave the first fruits into the kingdom of God. And it did not work for us. But at least you'll have a test. At least you'll know for yourself whether this idea works or not. Not because of a speaker told you it was a good idea, but because you read it in the word of God. Leviticus 23, 22 is talking about the crops and how Uh, The crops are reaped. And what the principle is, and we see it many times in scripture, scripture, Ruth and Boaz is a beautiful principle and picture of it. But he says in Leviticus, "Don't, don't clear your crops and harvest your crops all the way to the edge. Leave a margin around the end of your crop so that those who don't have food to eat can come and they can harvest the edge of your crop. See, this is God's mentality. God's mentality isn't for you and me to get leveraged as much as we can because somebody will give us credit. He wants us to be the lender so that we don't have to use up every resource we have, but we can leave the margin of our field for other people to come and eat those crops. And our mindset is like, man, I had to cut all the way to the very edge, to the very last stalk, to the very last plant, to the very last piece of fruit. I needed that. And then I borrowed some money to buy that land across the street so I could plant on that also. And God's saying, I want, you to, I want to free you from that by creating margin in your life. And step number one towards creating margin is to give first to God. It seems like a simple idea, but most people, I'm not talking people in the world, most people in church who love church do not do this. We've heard it all of our lives, but most people who love church, do not do this. Because the world has sold us this as the way to get where we want to be. But God is trying to help us see there's a promise over here waiting for you and waiting for me. The second thing that we prioritize is savings. And I I believe that God wants us to save Because God wants us to have the ability to lend to others, to help others, as it says in Ephesians, in their time of need. And so however you work it out, the second equation you need to come down to is first thing is 10% first fruits. Now, this number, obviously, you, you wanna move that number along as you grow in your maturity with Jesus. I don't think you wanna be right there about to shake hands with the Savior and still be at 10%. Because the gospel is retooling our thinking, and somewhere along the way, that gospel is going to get in our heart, and the 10% is going to go up to 20, then it's going to go up to 30, and then it's going to keep going up because we're going to understand this principle A is going to bless us. We're going to have more resources to give, more freedom, more decisions to make, and we're going to make more and more decisions to invest in the kingdom of God. But saving is the second part. And I know there's a lot of older people in this 915, but this message is going to be heard by a lot of people of all ages. I want to encourage you, no matter how old you are, if you are 16 years old, take stock of this right here. Do not model necessarily after your mom and dad or anybody else that you know. Model after God's promise on your life, Deuteronomy 28. Move toward a lifestyle of being the head and not being the tail, and you can start doing that at 16 or at 11 or at 24 or at 33 or wherever you are in life. I am the product, and I've said it before, and I love my mom and dad. They were amazing people. I am I'm here because of them. But my parents were great at a at a multitude of things, but one of them was not this. So both of my parents, and I say this kindly uh, because they're both in, in heaven, but both my parents passed away. It was insurance, I think, that allowed us to pay for both their funerals. There was not a lot left over in any case. And so what I grew up under was a spend mentality. You spend what you make. 
And no one ever taught me when I was 11 or 15 or 19 or 22 years old, hey, here's how you do this. Now, my mom was a champion giver, but unfortunately, my mom and dad were not great savers. My mom gave most of all of our possessions to the church. She gave all the silver they got at their wedding. She gave her violin, which cost like $1,500, and we were all, praise God, the day she did that. Um, (laughs) Thank you, Lord. We'll get you another instrument, Mom, a different kind, something else to learn. Um, she gave some of her jewelry. She, she was a very generous person. Uh, later in life, when we were helping my mom financially, we discovered she was giving all the money we were giving to her to other people. It was awesome. Hey, anybody got an elderly parent? You're in that boat right now? Mom, Dad, we're paying your mortgage. I know, but they're going on a mission trip to Tanzania, and I just wanted to give them that $500 that you gave me. Great, I gave them the $500. (laughs) So my mom helped me with this, but neither my mom or my dad helped me with this. And fortunately, I married into head and not the tail thinking. And I married into a family where I could begin to learn some of how this works. And the first thing that we learned was what everybody in the room already knows is that if you don't have an emergency fund, all of this is going to end up being a pipe dream for you. So we started with a practical idea. Three to six months, they say, um, of your income goes into an emergency fund. Now, that's hard to do when you're 28 years old and you're in debt, but you have to start a plan and a process. And we did, and we actually were able to accomplish that so that when the car brakes needed repair and when the washing machine stopped working or overflowed and ruined the floor and the insurance didn't cover it, or when a a death happened in the family and we had to fly out of town and spend nine days somewhere and we didn't have the money to do that in our normal budget, when all those things happened, we were able to absorb that And then refill that and make this the buffer that allowed us to keep saving and not eat savings. So an emergency fund, you're going to hear from Dave Ramsey, you'll hear from anybody else that's out there. Everybody's going to talk about having an emergency fund. But there again, most people in church are not giving as a first priority. And a lot of people do not have an emergency fund. And therefore, they're not saving because their savings is a barometer based on the circumstances of their life. Except for the little bit that's going into their 401k. But we're not going to see any of that for a long, long time. And that's not really helping us live free right now and leave a wake of generosity. And then the third thing is living. And you can read Dave Ramsey and figure out how much you should be saving and how much money you should be putting away for the future and how all that works for you. But maybe 10% is a good starting point again. 10%, 10%, emergency fund, and then we're going to live. You say, well, Louie, I can't do that. I can't live on 80% of what I'm making right now. And that's the idea that has to go away. I think a lot of us, we've got to rethink what our living and our expenses really looks like. Because there's Instagram quality of life, and then there's quality of life. Our neighbors are in New York again. They just went to Chicago last month. Babe, why haven't we gone anywhere recently? I know, I'm booking it right now. We're going to Charleston. Why? Because everybody went somewhere. Now, we didn't give, and we haven't really saved. Our emergency fund has dwindled, but we've got this amazing Visa card that came in the mail as a gift of God to us. (laughs) They said we could open it right now and A, get a free round trip ticket to anywhere we wanted to go, and we already know we're going to Charleston, And B, it has a low percentage rate until next month when it goes to (laughs) 5,000%. So what we're going to do is go to Charleston today, Popeye, and live it up. And we're going to worry about how to pay for it tomorrow. Because I bet tomorrow we'll get another gift from heaven 
in the mail. And then that Discover card comes. And they'll say, we'll roll up all your visa debt into here. And you won't know a thing until next month when the percentage rate is 75,000%. Say, I'm not worried about that. Because by the time you get ready to do that, Jack, I will have moved on to the Capital One campaign. (laughs) And I will be able to consolidate all of my debt, as if that's a great thing for a lower interest rate and get more bonus miles and get a free stay at extended stay hotels anywhere in the world. How many many of us are on that train? There's a lot of cutting up of cards going on. And at the end of the day, it's an Instagram lifestyle that causes us to live as the tail and not the head. And so we have to ask this question. After I give and after I save, what is left? I must live on this. And soon I will be free. I will be free to follow the Spirit The Spirit says, I want you guys to go to Tanzania. We're out. How'd you do that? We just packed our bags. But what about all your debt? What about all your obligations? What about all your credit? Oh, we don't have any. We're just going to go with God right here. Free to follow the Spirit. And a wake of generosity in our lives. And I'm just calling us up today to we have to take control of our own thinking. You cannot let... The offer that comes in the mail dictate your thinking. You have to dictate to the offer that comes in the mail your thinking. A big goal of the millennial generation, like I know anything about them, so I'm sorry I even said that, but oh, what do you know about that? Great, nothing. But I have observed possibly that a big goal of the millennial generation is home ownership. It's a big, big thing uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, among 20-somethings. We want to get out of apartment living, and we want to get in a home, preferably an in-town home, ITP home. If not, we'll take an OTP home. We just want to get a home. We want to get something that we can call our own. We want to start remodeling. We want to invest, da 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 And I believe in that, by the way. Uh, we're in a home. Um, but if you buy a home, at the closing, <laughs> all this comes into view. Because at the closing, you're signing a stack of papers this big, Yes, 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 initial here, 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 all the other names that you are known as in the the free world where your middle name is misspelled and your middle initial is wrong and blah, 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 and you're signing all that, sign, 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 sign. Then you get to that last page where they kind of distract you and say, oh, we brought you a bottle of champagne as you're signing the last page, which shows you what you're going to end up paying for your house. Has anybody done that before? Remember that page? You're like, give me the champagne. Go ahead and open it, (laughs) you know? (laughs) You're like, if you haven't bought a home, let me explain how that works to you. $250,000 house, you put $50,000 down, um, so you're financing $200,000 at 4%, right? You're paying $143,000 in interest on that house. You're like, that's over 30 years, and we're not living in it for 30 years. We already decided that. We'll be out of that house and, and so fast, and it's going to appreciate. We're going to make money, not lose money. And when we get out of it, we're going to get out of it at a better price. We're going to take money away when we walk away, and then we're going to buy a $500,000 house, and we're going to do that all over again. So you look at the end page, and it says you're going to pay $393,739 for a $250,000 house. And then we're going to take a picture in front of it and say, we are so excited to be homeowners. Real talk for a second. Hardly any homeowners in here. I bet there's less than 5% of the people in this building right now are homeowners. But in our mind, it's like, yay, we're homeowners. Because we've let the system dictate our thinking and not dictated God's thinking to the system. 
So I think it's a great goal to be a homeowner. Can we just say amen to that? I think every one of us should make it a goal to be homeowners, which means we would have a plan by which we're going to own our home. Not a plan by which we're going to pay the $1,575 a month and $218 of that are going to pay down the principal and all the rest of it is just going into a big till called interest, called debt. But we're going to make it our goal. We're going to pay for that house. We might have to do those double payments. We might start chipping down three times a year at the principal payment. When we got our tax return, we said, hey, let's don't go to Cancun this year. Let's take the $4,000 and pay it against our home debt. Let's start making decisions. And this is what we're going to talk about next week. This is creating wealth or creating margin is a better way to say it. Because I don't think creating wealth is necessarily the goal that any of us need. But this creates margin by which then we can be free to follow the Spirit of God and we can leave a, a, a wake of generosity in our life. And it, it comes down today to this. It comes down today to whether you believe this promise is true. That God wants to make you the head and not the tail. That God wants to flip the script and make you the head and not the tail. We all want that, but there is a pathway to that, and that pathway is called following his commandments and his ways. Obeying his commandments and his ways. Translate it, doing it God's way is how we move into the promise that he's offering us in our lives. Financially doing it God's way. And so if it looks to you like, I'd love to do that, Louis, but come on. I mean, look at me. I'm making $39,582 a year currently, and I owe $51,000 to my school. And that looks like an Everest to you, I know. But God is bigger than your Everest. And next week we're going to talk about how to attack that debt and to win your freedom from whatever debt you're facing right now. But it's got to be both things. Because here's the ticket. Some of us will get serious and attack our debt, and as soon as we do, Six months later, we'll make another decision that puts us right back into being the tail and not the head again. And we've got to make a lifestyle, wholesale decision to follow God's ways and to follow his commands, to live and pay as we go. No amens here or at Cumberland for that today. I know. But this concept is a great concept. We're going to live and pay as we go. We're going to live and pay as we go. I can pay for that, therefore I'm going to do that. And I've already given and I've already saved and with what I've got left, I can pay for that cruise and I've always wanted to go and see the Croatian coast and we're going this year and we're going to pay for it as we go every single day and not go, man, we're going to enjoy this trip and worry about how to pay for it later. No, we're paying for it right now. And when we get off this boat, we will have said, that was amazing. We surely enjoyed it. Everything about it was a blessing from God. And it's paid for. That's the kind of trip you want to go on. That's the kind of cruise you want to be on. That's the kind of lifestyle you want to be living. That's the power of the freedom that God wants to bring to your life. He started that with the cross where Jesus paid it all. So if you want to believe today that God wants to put you on a path of freedom from debt, just look at the cross. Because that's where Jesus paid it all so that your sin could be wiped away. You could be forgiven and free. You could be called a son or a daughter of God and have an eternity to enjoy the inheritance of the things of God that 
have become yours by grace through Christ.